Section nine of Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. The Natural History of Selborne by Gilbert White. Letters sixteen to twenty to the Honourable Daines Barrington. Letter sixteen to the Honourable Daines Barrington. Selborne, November the twentieth, seventeen seventy three. Dear Sir, in obedience to your injunctions, I sit down to give you some account of the house martin or martlet, and if my monography of this little domestic and familiar bird should happen to meet with your approbation, I may probably soon extend my inquiries to the rest of the British Hirundines, the swallow, the swift, and the bank martin. A few house martins begin to appear about the sixteenth of April, usually some few days later than the swallow. For some time after they appear, the Hirundines in general pay no attention to the business of nidification, but play and sport about, either to recruit from the fatigue of their journey, if they do migrate at all, or else that their blood may recover its true tone and texture after it has been so long benumbed by the severities of winter. About the middle of May, if the weather be fine, the martin begins to think in earnest of providing a mansion for its family. The crust, or shell, of this nest seems to be formed of such dirt or loam as comes most readily to hand, and is tempered and wrought together with little bits of broken straws, to render it tough and tenacious. As this bird often builds against a perpendicular wall without any projecting ledge under, it requires its utmost efforts to get the first foundation firmly fixed, so that it may safely carry the superstructure. On this occasion the bird not only clings with its claws, but partly supports itself by strongly inclining its tail against the wall, making that a fulcrum, and thus steadied it works and plasters the materials into the face of the brick or stone. But then, that this work may not, while it is soft and green, pull itself down by its own weight, the provident architect has prudence and forbearance enough not to advance her work too fast, but by building only in the morning, and by dedicating the rest of the day to food and amusement, gives it sufficient time to dry and harden. About half an inch seems to be a sufficient layer for a day. Thus, careful workmen, when they build mud walls, informed at first perhaps by this lithe bird, raise but a moderate layer at a time, and then desist, lest the work should become top-heavy, and so be ruined by its own weight. By this method, in about ten or twelve days, is formed an hemispheric nest, with a small aperture towards the top, strong, compact, and warm, and perfectly fitted for all the purposes for which it was intended. But then nothing is more common than for the house-sparrow, as soon as the shell is finished, to seize on it as its own, to eject the owner, and to line it after its own manner. After so much labour is bestowed in erecting a mansion, as nature seldom works in vain, martins will breed on for several years together in the same nest, where it happens to be well sheltered and secure from the injuries of weather. The shed or crust of the nest is a sort of rustic work full of knobs and protuberances on the outside, nor is the inside of those that I have examined smoothed with any exactness at all, but is rendered soft and warm and fit for incubation by a lining of small straws, grasses and feathers, and sometimes by a bed of moss interwoven with wool. In this nest they tread, or engender, frequently during the time of building, and the hen lays from three to five white eggs. At first, when the young are hatched, and are in a naked and helpless condition, the parent birds, with tender assiduity, carry out what comes away from their young. Was it not for this affectionate cleanliness, the nestlings would soon be burnt up and destroyed in so deep and hollow a nest by their own caustic excrement? In the quadruped creation the same neat precaution is made use of, particularly among dogs and cats, where the dams lick away what proceeds from their young. But in birds there seems to be a particular provision that the dung of nestlings is enveloped into a tough kind of jelly, and therefore is the easier conveyed off without soiling or daubing. Yet, as nature is cleanly in all her ways, the young perform this office for themselves in a little time, by thrusting their tails out at the aperture of their nest. As the young of small birds presently arrive at their elichia, or full growth, they soon become impatient of confinement, 
and sit all day with their heads out at the orifice, where the dams, by clinging to the nest, supply them with food from morning to night. For a time the young are fed on the wing by their parents, but the feat is done by so quick and almost imperceptible a slight that a person must have attended very exactly to their motions before he would be able to perceive it. As soon as the young are able to shift for themselves, the dams immediately turn their thoughts to the business of a second brood, while the first flight, shaken off and rejected by their nurses, congregate in great flocks, and are the birds that are seen clustering and hovering on sunny mornings and evenings, round towers and steeples, and on the roofs of churches and houses. These congregations usually begin to take place about the first week in August, and therefore we may conclude that by that time the first flight is pretty well over. The young of this species do not quit their abodes altogether, but the more forward birds get abroad some days before the rest. These, approaching the eaves of buildings and playing about before them, make people think that several old ones attend one nest. They are often capricious in fixing on a nesting place, beginning many edifices, and leaving them unfinished. But when, once, a nest is completed in a sheltered place, it serves for several seasons. Those which breed in a ready-finished house get the start in hatching of those that build new by ten days or a fortnight. These industrious artificers are at their labours in the long days before four in the morning. When they fix their materials, they plaster them on with their chins, moving their heads with a quick vibratory motion. They dip and wash as they fly sometimes in very hot weather, but not so frequently as swallows. It has been observed that martins usually build to a north-east or north-west aspect, that the heat of the sun may not crack and destroy their nests. But instances are also remembered where they bred for many years in vast abundance in an hot, stifled inn-yard against a wall facing to the south. Birds in general are wise in their choice of situation but in this neighbourhood every summer is seen a strong proof to the contrary at an house without eaves in an exposed district, where some martins build year by year in the corners of the windows. But as the corners of these windows, which face to the south-east and south-west, are too shallow, the nests are washed down every hard rain, and yet these birds drudge on to no purpose from summer to summer without changing their aspect or house. It is a piteous sight to see them labouring, when half their nest is washed away and bringing dirt. Generis lapsi sarciri ruinas. Virgil. Reader's Note. To repair the ruins of their fallen race. End Reader's Note. Thus is instinct a most wonderful unequal faculty, in some instances so much above reason, in other respects so far below it. Martins love to frequent towns especially if there are great lakes and rivers at hand. Nay, they even affect the close air of London, and I have not only seen them nesting in the borough, but even in the Strand and Fleet Street. But then it was obvious from the dinginess of their aspect that their feathers partook of the filth of that sooty atmosphere. Martins are by far the least agile of the four species. Their wings and tails are short, and therefore they are not capable of such surprising turns and quick and glancing evolutions as the swallow. Accordingly they make use of a placid, easy motion in a middle region of the air, seldom mounting to any great height, and never sweeping long together over the surface of the ground or water. They do not wander far for food, but affect sheltered districts, over some lake, or under some hanging wood, or in some hollow vale, especially in windy weather. They breed the latest of all the swallow kind. In 1772 they had nestlings on to October the 21st, and are never without unfledged young as late as Michaelmas. As the summer declines, the congregating flocks increase in numbers daily by the constant accession of the second broods, till at last they swarm in myriads upon myriads round the villages on the Thames, darkening the face of the sky as they frequent the aits of that river where they roost. They retire, the bulk of them, I mean, in vast flocks together about the beginning of October, but have appeared of late years in a considerable flight in this neighbourhood for one day or two as late as November the 3rd and 6th, after they were supposed to have been gone for more than a fortnight. They therefore withdraw with us the latest of any species. Unless these birds are very short-lived indeed, or unless they do not return to the district where they are bred, they must undergo vast devastations somehow and somewhere, 
For the birds that return yearly bear no manner of proportion to the birds that retire. House martins are distinguished from their congeners by having their legs covered with soft downy feathers down to their toes. They are no songsters, but twitter in a pretty, inward, soft manner in their nests. During the time of breeding they are often greatly molested with fleas. I am, etc. Letter 17 to the Honourable Danes Barrington Ringma, near Lewis, December the ninth, 1773 Dear Sir, I received your last favour just as I was setting out for this place, and am pleased to find that my monography met with your approbation. My remarks are the result of many years' observation, and are, I trust, true on the whole, though I do not pretend to say that they are perfectly void of mistake, or that a more nice observer ought not make many additions, since subjects of this kind are inexhaustible. If you think my letter worthy the notice of your respectable society, you are at liberty to lay it before them, and they will consider it, I hope, as it was intended, as an humble attempt to promote a more minute inquiry into natural history, into the life and conversation of animals. Perhaps hereafter I may be induced to take the house swallow under consideration, and from that proceed to the rest of the British Hirondines. Though I have now travelled the Sussex Downs upward of thirty years, yet I still investigate that chain of majestic mountains with fresh admiration year by year, and think I see new beauties every time I traverse it. This range, which runs from Chichester eastward as far as Eastbourne, is about sixty miles in length, and is called the South Downs, properly speaking, only round Lewis. As you pass along you command a noble view of the wild, or wheeled, on one hand, and the broad downs and sea on the other. Mr. Ray used to visit a family just at the foot of these hills, and was so ravished with the prospect from Plumpton Plain near Lewis, that he mentions those scapes in his Wisdom of God in the Works of the Creation, with the utmost satisfaction, and thinks them equal to anything he had seen in the finest parts of Europe. For my own part, I think there is somewhat peculiarly sweet and amusing in the shapely figured aspect of chalk hills, in preference to those of stone, which are rugged, broken, abrupt, and shapeless. Perhaps I may be singular in my opinion, and not so happy as to convey to you the same idea, but I never contemplate these mountains without thinking I perceive somewhat analogous to growth in their gentle swellings and smooth fungus-like protuberances their fluted sides and regular hollows and slopes, that carry at once the air of vegetative dilation and expansion. Or was there ever a time when these immense masses of calcareous matter were drawn into fermentation by some adventitious moisture, were raised and leavened into such shapes by some plastic power, and so made to swell and heave their broad backs into the sky so much above the less animated clay of the wild below? By what I can guess from the ad measurements of the hills that have been taken round my house, I should suppose that these hills surmount the wild at an average at about the rate of five hundred feet. One thing is very remarkable as to the sheep. From the westward, till you get to the river Adur, all the flocks have horns, and smooth white faces, and white legs, and a hornless sheep is rarely to be seen. But as soon as you pass the river eastward and mount Beeding Hill, all the flocks at once become hornless, or as they call them, pole sheep, and have moreover black faces with a white tuft of wool on their foreheads, and speckled and spotted legs, so that you would think that the flocks of Laban were pasturing on one side of the stream, and the variegated breed of his son-in-law Jacob were cantoned along on the other. And this diversity holds good, respectively, on each side, from the valley of Bramber and Beeding to the eastward, and westward all the whole length of the downs. If you talk with the shepherds on this subject, they tell you that the case has been so from time immemorial, and smile at your simplicity if you ask them whether the situation of these two different breeds might not be reversed. However, an intelligent friend of mine near Chichester is determined to try the experiment, and has this autumn, at the hazard of being laughed at, 
introduced a parcel of black-faced hornless rams among his horned western ewes. The black-faced pole sheep have the shortest legs and the finest wool. As I had hardly ever before travelled these downs at so late a season of the year, I was determined to keep as sharp a lookout as possible so near the southern coast, with respect to the summer short-winged birds of passage. We make great inquiries concerning the withdrawing of the swallow kind, without examining enough into the causes why this tribe is never to be seen in winter. For entre nous, the disappearing of the latter is more marvellous than that of the former, and much more unaccountable. The Hirundines, if they please, are certainly capable of migration, and yet no doubt are often found in a torpid state. But red starts, nightingales, white throats, black caps, etc., etc., are very ill provided for long flights, have never been once found, as I ever heard of, in a torpid state, and yet can never be supposed in such troops from year to year to dodge and elude the eyes of the curious and inquisitive, which from day to day discern the other small birds that are known to abide our winters here. But, notwithstanding all my care, I saw nothing like a summer bird of passage, and what is more strange, not one wheat ear, though they are bound so in the autumn as to be a considerable perquisite to the shepherds that take them, and though many are to be seen, to my knowledge, all the winter through in many parts of the south of England. The most intelligent shepherds tell me that some few of these birds appear on the downs in March, and then withdraw to breed, probably in warrens and stone quarries. Now and then a nest is ploughed up in a fallow on the downs under a furrow, but it is thought a rarity. At the time of wheat harvest they begin to be taken in great numbers, are sent for sale in vast quantities to Brighthelmstone and Tunbridge, and appear at the tables of all the gentry that entertain with any degree of elegance. About Michaelmas they retire, and are seen no more till March, though these birds are, when in season, in great plenty on the south downs round Lewis. Yet at Eastbourne, which is the eastern extremity of those downs, they abound much more. One thing is very remarkable, that, though in the height of the season so many hundreds of dozens are taken, yet they never are seen to flock, and it is a rare thing to see more than three or four at a time so that there must be a perpetual flitting and constant progressive succession. It does not appear that any wheat ears are taken to the westward of Horton Bridge, which stands on the river Arran. I did not fail to look particularly after my new migration of ring ousels, and to take notice whether they continued on the downs to this season of the year, as I had formerly remarked them in the month of October all the way from Chichester to Lewis, wherever there were any shrubs and covert but not one bird of this sort came within my observation. I only saw a few larks and wind-chats, some rooks and several kites and buzzards. About midsummer a flight of crossbills comes to the pine-groves about this house, but never makes any long stay. The old tortoise that I have mentioned in a former letter still continues in this garden, and retired underground about the 20th of November, and came out again for one day on the 30th. It lies now buried in a wet swampy border under a wall facing to the south, and is enveloped at present in mud and mire. Here is a large rookery round this house, the inhabitants of which seem to get their livelihood very easily, for they spend the greatest part of the day on their nest trees, when the weather is mild. These rooks retire every evening all the winter from this rookery, where they only call by the way, as they are going to roost in deep woods. At the dawn of day they always revisit their nest-trees, and are preceded a few minutes by a flight of doors, that act, as it were, as their harbingers. I am, etc. Letter 18 to the Honourable Danes Barrington, Selborne, January the ninth, 1774. Dear Sir, the house-swallow, or chimney-swallow, is undoubtedly the first comer of all the British Hirondines and appears in general on or about the 13th of April, as I have remarked from many years' observation. Not but now and then a straggler is seen much earlier, and, in particular, when I was a boy, I observed a swallow for a whole day together, on a sunny, warm Shrove Tuesday, which day could not fall out later than the middle of March, and often happened early in February. 
It is worth remarking that these birds are seen first about lakes and mill-ponds, and it is also very particular that if these early visitors happen to find frost and snow, as was the case of the two dreadful springs of 1770 and 1771, they immediately withdraw for a time, a circumstance this much more in favour of hiding than migration, since it is much more probable that a bird should retire to its hibernaculum just at hand than return for a week or two only to warmer latitudes. The swallow, though called the chimney-swallow, by no means builds altogether in chimneys, but often within barns and outhouses against the rafters, and so she did in Virgil's time. Ante garrila quam tignis nidos suspendat hirundo. Reader's note. Before the swallow, the chatterer, hangs its nest from the rafters. Virgil. End note. In Sweden she builds in barns, and is called ladu swala, the barn swallow. Besides, in the warmer parts of Europe there are no chimneys to houses, except they are English-built. In these countries she constructs her nest in porches and gateways, and galleries and open halls. Here and there a bird may affect some odd peculiar place, as we have known a swallow build down the shaft of an old well, through which chalk has been formerly drawn up for the purpose of manure. But in general with us this hirondo breeds in chimneys and loves to haunt those stacks where there is a constant fire, no doubt for the sake of warmth. Not that it can subsist in the immediate shaft where there is a fire, but prefers one adjoining to that of the kitchen, and disregards the perpetual smoke of that funnel, as I have often observed with some degree of wonder. Five or six or more feet down the chimney does this little bird begin to form her nest, about the middle of May, which consists, like that of the house-martin, of a crust or shell composed of dirt or mud, mixed with short pieces of straw to render it tough and permanent, with this difference, that whereas the shell of the martin is nearly hemispheric, that of the swallow is open at the top, and like half a deep dish. This nest is lined with fine grasses, and feathers which are often collected as they float in the air. Wonderful is the address which this adroit bird shows all day long in ascending and descending with security through so narrow a pass. When hovering over the mouth of the funnel, the vibrations of her wings acting on the confined air occasion a rumbling like thunder. It is not improbable that the dam submits to this inconvenient situation so low in the shaft, in order to secure her broods from rapacious birds and particularly from owls, which frequently fall down chimneys, perhaps in attempting to get at these nestlings. The swallow lays from four to six white eggs, dotted with red specks, and brings out her first brood about the last week in June, or the first week in July. The progressive method by which the young are introduced into life is very amusing. First they emerge from the shaft with difficulty enough, and often fall down into the rooms below. For a day or so they are fed on the chimney-top, and then they are conducted to the dead leafless bough of some tree, where, sitting in a row, they are attended with great assiduity, and may then be called perchers. In a day or two more they become flyers, but are still unable to take their own food. Therefore they play about near the place where the dams are hawking for flies, and when a mouthful is collected, at a certain signal given, the dam and the nestlings advance, rising towards each other, and meeting at an angle the young one all the while uttering such a little quick note of gratitude and complacency, that a person must have paid very little of regard to the wonders of nature that has not often remarked this feat. The dam betakes herself immediately to the business of a second brood as soon as she is disengaged from her first, which at once associates with the first broods of house-martins, and with them congregates, clustering on sunny roofs, towers, and trees. This hirundo brings out her second brood towards the middle and end of August. All the summer long is the swallow a most instructive pattern of unwearied industry and affection, for from morning to night, while there is a family to be supported, she spends the whole day in skimming close to the ground and exerting the most sudden turns and quick evolutions. Avenues and long walks under hedges, and pasture fields, and mown meadows where cattle graze, are her delight especially if there are trees interspersed, because in such spots insects most abound. When a fly is taken, a smart snap from her bill is heard, resembling the noise at the shutting of a watch-case, but the motion of the mandibles are too quick for the eye. The swallow, probably the male bird, 
is the excubitor to house martins and other little birds, announcing the approach of birds of prey. For as soon as an hawk appears, with a shrill alarming note, he calls all the swallows and martins about him, who pursue in a body and buffet and strike their enemy, till they have driven him from the village, darting down from above on his back, and rising in a perpendicular line in perfect security. This bird also will sound the alarm and strike at cats when they climb on the roofs of houses, or otherwise approach the nests. Each species of hirundo drinks as it flies along, sipping the surface of the water, but the swallow alone, in general, washes on the wing, by dropping into a pool for many times together. In very hot weather house-martins and bank-martins dip and wash a little. The swallow is a delicate songster, and in soft sunny weather sings both perching and flying, on trees in a kind of concert, and on chimney-pots. Is also a bold flyer, ranging to distant downs and commons even in windy weather, which the other species seem much to dislike, nay, even frequenting exposed seaport towns, and making little excursions over the salt water. Horsemen on wide downs are often closely attended by a little party of swallows for miles together, which plays before and behind them, sweeping around and collecting all the skulking insects that are roused by the trampling of the horse's feet. When the wind blows hard, without this expedient, they are often forced to settle, or to pick up their lurking prey. This species feeds much on little coleoptera, as well as on gnats and flies, and often settles on dug ground or paths for gravels to grind and digest its food. Before they depart, for some weeks, to a bird they forsake houses and chimneys, and roost in trees, and usually withdraw about the beginning of October, though some few stragglers may appear on, at times, till the first week in November. Some few pairs haunt the new and open streets of London, next to the fields, but do not enter, like the house-martin, the close and crowded parts of the city. Both male and female are distinguished from their congeners by the length and forkedness of their tails. They are undoubtedly the most nimble of all the species, and when the male pursues the female in amorous chase, they then go beyond their usual speed, and exert a rapidity almost too quick for the eye to follow. After this circumstantial detail of the life and discerning otorge of the swallow, I shall add, for your further amusement, an anecdote or two, not much in favour of her sagacity. A certain swallow built for two years together on the handles of a pair of garden shears that were stuck up against the boards in an outhouse, and therefore must have her nest spoiled whenever that implement was wanted. And what is stranger still, another bird of the same species built its nest on the wings and body of an owl that happened by accident to hang dead and dry from the rafter of a barn. This owl, with the nest on its wings, and with eggs in the nest, was brought as a curiosity worthy the most elegant private museum in Great Britain. The owner, struck with the oddity of the sight, furnished the bringer with a large shell or conch, desiring him to fix it just where the owl hung. The person did as he was ordered, and the following year a pair, probably the same pair, built their nest in the conch, and laid their eggs. The owl and the conch make a strange, grotesque appearance, and are not the least curious specimens in that wonderful collection of art and nature. Note, Sir Ashton Lever's Museum. End note. Thus is instinct in animals taken the least out of its way, an undistinguishing, limited faculty, and blind to every circumstance that does not immediately respect self-preservation, or lead at once to the propagation or support of their species. I am, with all respect, etc., etc. Letter 19 to the Honourable Danes Barrington, Selborne, February the 14th, 1774. Dear Sir, I received your favour of the 8th, and am pleased to find that you read my little history of the swallow with your usual candour, nor was I less pleased to find that you made objections where you saw reason. As to the quotations, it is difficult to say precisely which species of hirundo Virgil might intend in the lines in question, since the ancients did not attend to specific differences like modern naturalists. Yet somewhat may be gathered enough to incline me to suppose that in the two passages quoted the poet had his eye on the swallow. In the first place, the epithet Garula suits the swallow well, who is a great songster, but not the martin, which is rather a mute bird and when it sings is so inward as scarce to be heard. Besides, if Tignum, 
in that place signifies a rafter rather than a beam, as it seems to me to do, then I think it must be the swallow that is alluded to, and not the martin, since the former does frequently build within the roof against the rafters, while the latter always, as far as I have been able to observe, builds without the roof against eaves and cornices. As to the simile, too much stress must not be laid on it. Yet the epithet nigra speaks plainly in favour of the swallow, whose back and wings are very black, while the rump of the martin is milk-white, its back and wings blue, and all its under part white as snow. Nor can the clumsy motions, well, comparatively clumsy, of the martin well represent the sudden and artful evolutions and quick turns which Juturna gave to her brother's chariot, so as to elude the eager pursuit of the enraged Aeneas. The verb sonat also seems to imply a bird that is somewhat loquacious. Note, nigra velut magnas domini cum divitis aedes pervolat, et penis alta atria lustra terundo, pabula parva legens, nidisque loquacibus escas, et nunc porticibus vacuis, nunc humida circum stagna sonat. End note. Reader's note. In the same way, a black swallow flies through the mansion of a rich lord, and passes with her wings the lofty halls, picking up little scraps of food and morsels for her chirping nestlings. Now she utters her call in the empty porticoes, now about the wet swamps. End reader's note. We have had a very wet autumn and winter, so as to raise the springs to a pitch beyond anything since 1764, which was a remarkable year for floods and high waters. The land springs, which we call lavants, break out much on the downs of Sussex, Hampshire, and Wiltshire. The country people say, when the lavants rise, corn will always be dear, meaning that when the earth is so glutted with water as to send forth springs on the downs and uplands, that the corn vales must be drowned, and so it has proved for these ten or eleven years past, for land springs have never obtained more since the memory of man than during that period, nor has there been known a greater scarcity of all sorts of grain, considering the great improvements of modern husbandry. Such a run of wet seasons a century or two ago would, I am persuaded, have occasioned a famine. Therefore pamphlets and newspaper letters that talk of combinations tend to inflame and mislead, since we must not expect plenty till Providence sends us more favourable seasons. The wheat of last year, all round this district, and in the county of Rutland and elsewhere, yields remarkably bad, and our wheat on the ground, by the continual late sudden vicissitudes from fierce frost to pouring rains, looks poorly, and the turnips rot very fast. Letter 20 to the Honourable Danes Barrington Selborne, February the 26th, 1774 Dear Sir, the sand martin, or bank martin, is by much the least of any of the British hirundines, and as far as we have ever seen, the smallest known hirundo, though Brisson asserts that there is one much smaller, and that is the hirundo esculenta. But it is much to be regretted that it is scarce possible for any observer to be so full and exact as he could wish in reciting the circumstances attending the life and conversation of this little bird, since it is fera natura at least in this part of the kingdom, disclaiming all domestic attachments, and haunting wild heaths and commons where there are large lakes, while the other species, especially the swallow and house-martin, are remarkably gentle and domesticated, and never seem to think themselves safe but under the protection of man. Here in this parish, in the sand-pits and banks of the lakes of Walmer Forest, several colonies of these birds, and yet they are never seen in the village nor do they at all frequent the cottages that are scattered about in that wild district. The only instance I ever remember where this species haunts any building is at the town of Bishop's Waltham, in this county, where many sand-martins nestle and breed in the scaffold-holes of the back wall of William of Wickham's stables. But then this wall stands in a very sequestered and retired enclosure, and faces upon a large and beautiful lake, and indeed this species seems so to delight in large waters, that no instance occurs of their abounding but near vast pools or rivers, and in particular it has been remarked that they swarm in the banks of the Thames in some places below London Bridge. It is curious to observe with what different degrees of architectonic skill 
Providence has endowed birds of the same genus, and so nearly correspondent in their general mode of life. For while the swallow and the house-martin discover the greatest address in raising and securely fixing crusts or shells of loam as cunabula for their young, the bank-martin terebrates a round and regular hole in the sand or earth, which is serpentine, horizontal, and about two feet deep. At the inner end of this burrow does this bird deposit, in a good degree of safety, her rude nest, consisting of fine grasses and feathers, usually goose-feathers, very inartificially laid together. Perseverance will accomplish anything, though at first one would be disinclined to believe that this weak bird with her soft and tender bill and claws should ever be able to bore the stubborn sandbank without entirely disabling herself. Yet with these feeble instruments have I seen a pair of them make great dispatch, and could remark how much they had scooped that day by the fresh sand which ran down the bank, and was of a different colour from that which lay loose and bleached in the sun. In what space of time these little artists are able to mine and finish these cavities, I have never been able to discover, for reasons given above, but it would be a matter worthy of observation, where it falls in the way of any naturalist to make his remarks. This I have often taken notice of, that several holes of different depths are left unfinished at the end of summer. To imagine that these beginnings were intentionally made, in order to be in the greater forwardness for next spring, is allowing perhaps too much foresight and rerum prudentia to a simple bird. May not the cause of these latibrae being left unfinished arise from their meeting in those places with strata too harsh, hard, and solid for their purpose, which they relinquish and go to a fresh spot that works more freely? Or may they not in other places fall in with a soil as much too loose and mouldering, liable to flounder, and threatening to overwhelm them and their labours. One thing is remarkable, that after some years the old holes are forsaken, and new ones bored, perhaps because the old habitations grow foul and fetid from long use, or because they may so abound with fleas as to become untenable. This species of swallow, moreover, is strangely annoyed with fleas, and we have seen fleas, bed-fleas, pulex irritans, swarming at the mouths of these holes, like bees upon the stools of their hives. The following circumstance should by no means be omitted, that these birds do not make use of their caverns by way of hibernacular, as might be expected, since banks so perforated have been dug out with care in the winter, when nothing was found but empty nests. The sand-martin arrives much about the same time with the swallow, and lays, as she does, from four to six white eggs. But as the species is cryptogamy, carrying on the business of nidification, incubation, and the support of its young in the dark, it would not be so easy to ascertain the time of breeding, were it not for the coming forth of the broods, which appear much about the time, or rather somewhat earlier than those of the swallow. The nestlings are supported in common like those of their congeners, with gnats and other small insects, and sometimes they are fed with libellulae, dragonflies, almost as long as themselves. In the last week in June we have seen a row of these sitting on a rail near a great pool as perchers, and so young and helpless as easily to be taken by hand, but whether the dams ever feed them on the wing, as swallows and house-martins do, we have never yet been able to determine, nor do we know whether they pursue and attack birds of prey. When they happen to breed near hedges and enclosures, they are dispossessed of their breeding-holes by the house-sparrow, which is on the same account a fell adversary to house-martins. These hirundines are no songsters, but rather mute, making only a little harsh noise when a person approaches their nests. They seem not to be of a sociable turn, never with us, congregating with their congeners in the autumn. Undoubtedly they breed a second time, like the house-martin and swallow, and withdraw about Michaelmas. Though in some particular districts they may happen to abound, yet in the whole, in the south of England at least, is this much the rarest species, for there are few towns or large villages, but what abound with house-martins, few churches, towers, or steeples, but what are haunted by some swifts, scarce a hamlet or single cottage chimney that has not its swallow, while the bank-martins, scattered here and there, live a sequestered life among some abrupt sand-hills, and in the banks of some few rivers. These birds have a peculiar manner of flying, flitting about with odd jerks and vacillations, not unlike the motions of a butterfly. Doubtless the flight of all hirundines is influenced by, and adapted to, the peculiar sort of insects which furnish their food. 
Hence it would be worth inquiry to examine what particular group of insects affords the principal food of each respective species of swallow. Notwithstanding what has been advanced above, some few sand-martins I see haunt the skirts of London, frequenting the dirty pools in St. George's Fields, and about White Chapel. The question is where these build, since there are no banks or bold shores in that neighbourhood. Perhaps they nestle in the scaffold-holes of some old or new deserted building. They dip and wash as they fly sometimes, like the house-martin and swallow. Sand-martins differ from their congeners in the diminutiveness of their size, and in their colour, which is what is usually called a mouse-colour. Near Valencia, in Spain, they are taken, says Willoughby, and sold in the markets for the table, and are called by the country people, probably from their desultory jerking manner of flight, Papillon de Montagne. End of section 9 of Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne